dialogue at this point. A motion to approve. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify the aye. 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 Okay, thank you. So we are at a unique place in the life of our nation as we face pandemic, economic issues, political division, and schools have not been exempted from, from this disruption. I spoke in Indianapolis with Dr. Jenner recently where we talked about the fact that COVID has been a multiplier. Where we had challenges already, the pandemic has multiplied those challenges. People are anxious. Uh, we have economic uncertainty and education uh, while it provides the surest path through that anxiety has become in many ways a political football. I'm gonna spend some time this evening, and if you'll indulge me, going through some background. It is at a high level, uh, and it is, uh, some of this is by way of example, but I will be specific when that's the case. I want to go for a moment and speak about House and Roll Act 1315, which created the venue where we sit tonight with this group. That was passed in May of special session, May of 2018, by the Indiana General Assembly to create the historic partnership between Ball State University and Muncie Community Schools. This legislation was passed to enable our schools, and this is a quotation from the statute, to take advantage of its relationship with the university and grants the district all administrative and academic flexibility to implement innovative strategies. The statute required the submission of an academic innovation and financial viability plan by June the 30th, 2020. This has occurred. It is available on our website and hard copies would be available upon request. The mission statement includes the phrase placing learners first. And that has been the guiding load store for this board. The development of this plan was a community-wide effort. With the assistance of the United Way, we held over 50 listening sessions throughout the city. We heard from over 500 parents and caregivers, from over 20 local nonprofits and foundations, from most of our Muncie Community School faculty, and a broad-based national panel of educational experts. A significant part of that plan, again driven by parents, faculty, local funders, and nationally recognized educators was social emotional learning. So social emotional learning, which has become controversial, I'm going to talk about what it is. In this political device of time so full of misinformation and resultant anxieties, we have received a number of questions about the need for social emotional learning and its curriculum in our public schools. In short, SEL, which is what I'll call it, promotes whole child development by teaching skills like self-regulation, persistence, empathy, self-awareness, and mindfulness. Practically speaking, it teaches students to regulate their emotions, to pay attention, and to work well with peers. All you have to do is look at the news on social media or on your television at night, and you can see that some of those lessons have been lost on our fellow citizens. All of these are valuable and important attributes of educational and personal growth and success. The curricula used at MCS is Second Step Success. If anyone wishes to see it, we will happily get you a complete copy. This is not a new curriculum. The Bush administration named this an exemplary program in 2001. While we may, may wish to believe that these life skills are with our students when they arrive at the schoolhouse door, some of our learners come from backgrounds where they do not receive modeling of these behaviors from any adult, sibling, or peer. In fact, the modeling is often, often counterproductive. To those who question the need for such learning modules, whether out of sincere interest or political mischief, I would ask the following questions. And some of this is driven by my experience as a trial judge in Union County, Indiana, Liberty, where I had jurisdiction, including criminal, domestic, and juvenile would ask these questions. Did you move 10 or more times, at least twice due to eviction between the ages of five and 18? Did one or both parents spend at least a month in jail or prison during your childhood? 
Did one of your parents die a premature death due to drugs, violence, or insufficient medical care? Did you grow up in a household with no books? Have you ever lived in a vehicle for any period of time? Have you or a sibling ever been a victim of abuse, neglect, or sexual assault? Have you been in your house to witness an act of domestic violence against a parent or a caregiver? Have you ever been sick with strep throat, bronchitis, the flu, a tooth infection, scabies, or head lice, and not had adequate medical intervention? Have you ever gone to school hungry or to bed hungry? Have you ever witnessed a caregiver commit an act of unimaginable cruelty to a family pet? And I could go on. During the last 30 years of practicing law, serving as a trial judge with criminal and juvenile jurisdiction, immediate or domestic cases, including today, an arbitrator, and in working and volunteering in public schools. I have worked with many young learners who have endured one or sometimes several of these traumas. As we've learned more precisely over the last 20 years through brain science, traumas of this magnitude for any person, but especially for someone with a developing body and brain, will wreak emotional and physical havoc. They are, in fact, a form of malignancy. SEL is simply one of many tools that our magnificent educators use to help and educate children. When people ask if there is any political agenda, hidden or otherwise, we should answer, honestly and truthfully, that the only agenda is to do our level best to help our children get to a point where they can feel a sense of confidence and security that enables them to learn, that gives them a sense of hope, and that helps them to see a path where they can be in greater control of their destinies as adults through perseverance, self-reliance, and reaching out to loved ones, family, and trusted others for help when they need it. On a personal note, emphasizing this or illustrating it perhaps, I was born in 1966. My brother was born in 1970. While we had good parents, I can say without reservation that my own social emotional learning was enhanced by none other than Fred Rogers. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood debuted in 1968. It ran until 2001. This program, for those who may not have seen it, was on PBS and emphasized young children's social emotional needs. Rogers taught young children about civility, sharing, tolerance, and self-worth. Like many in this room, I also learned these lessons or had them emphasized from several of my teachers. In my case, I think of Mrs. Marion Pope, my third grade teacher at Kitchell Elementary, who recently died as she neared the age of 100. So I suppose that this may be political with the broadest possi possible definition, but not in the nefarious manner that some would have you believe. Now turning to social studies and English language arts, what is our goals for social studies? And Mrs. Snyder's here tonight, and, and some of this comes from her department. What it is, it is our goal to develop in citizens that will perpetuate our democratic, democratic traditions, aware that we work with one another to move forward. Developing human beings that understand that no one's experience is universal. Developing students that are seekers, privileging learning over knowledge. Learning history through the experience of more than one perspective. Learning government and economics with a consciousness of how policies impact different people in different ways. What it is not, it is not classrooms built up from lecture and thoughtless rote memorization of trivia and names and dates. In my case, as much as I loved Union County High School and as much as I loved Kelly Drake who taught history, it was terribly, terribly, terribly boring. God rest Mr. Drake's soul. <laughs> the, it is not the imposition of a worldview that attempts to set or prescribe norms and its history. It's not history detached from the present because history is a continuum as I will talk about in a moment. And it is not critical race theory. That leads to my next point or discussion, critical race theory. What is it? We've heard the term critical race theory a good bit over the past several months. I saw at one point where critical race theory was noted on CNN one day like 277 times during the course of a day. However, when I have inquired, the vast majority of people do not have a correct understanding of what that term entails or means. As a result, misinformation and misunderstanding have filled the vacuum. Anytime there's misinformation being disseminated for primarily political purposes on either side of this spectrum, one of the goals is to create fear and apprehension among listeners. 
This false anxiety is then used to drive a political agenda, whether that be from the right or the left. With that background, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, several law schools in the United States saw the emergence of critical legal studies. Note that's separate and distinct from critical race theory. Critical Le legal studies, or CLS, developed as a branch of legal studies uh, during that period of time. Again, the late 1960s, early 1970s. Its genesis at that time, or its beginning, was a natural outgrowth of upheaval over the Vietnam War, frustration with the pace of the civil rights movement, and general dissatisfaction with the political status quo exemplified by the Nixon administration scandals that culminated in Watergate. As I will discuss in a moment, critical legal studies, again, formed the foundation on which critical race theory then emerged. At its core, though deep differences have emerged among and between scholars of critical legal theories, imagine that, differences between scholars. It alleges that laws, both legislatively enacted statutes and court-driven common law, have been constructed or construed or drafted in a manner to maintain status quo power structures that create significant economic and social hurdles for marginalized groups. Marginalized groups have been defined in that uh, scholarly study without limitation by gender, national origin, race, ethnic ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or the economically impoverished. As the 1970s gave way to the 1980s, Harvard Law School's first black tenured professor, Derek Bell, wrote a law journal article entitled Brown versus Board of Education and the Interest Convergence Dilemma. That's, that law journal article formed the core basis for the beginning of critical race theory. By way of background, Bell received tenure at Harvard in 1971. Prior to that, he was a lawyer at the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, handling civil rights litigation. A bit of history, the LDF, or Legal Defense Fund's predecessor in interest, with Thorogood Marshall as the lead trial lawyer, handled the Brown case, resulting in the Supreme Court's 1954 decision in Brown versus Board of Education, desegregating public schools across much of the United States. Even in 1980, Professor Bell's article was deeply controversial in that it critically questioned the NAACP's strategy of integration. For many, the Brown decision was thought to represent a moral awakening and the prevalence of decency among, among a core majority of American citizens. Bell theorized in his argument that to the contrary, the court's determination was the result of an interest convergence in Cold War pragmatism. In short, as the US was locked in its struggle with the Soviet Union, the images of racial oppression in the U.S. handed the Soviets a propaganda weapon to wield at home in Eastern Europe and in third world countries. Consequently, according to Bell's theory, and it was and remains a theory, the court's Brown decision was an effective means to deprive the Soviets of a propaganda, propaganda tool and was in the broader interest, the broader political interest of the United States. While Bell's theories were subject and remain subject to criticisms from a number of quarters, they gained tractions with a group of academics at several other law schools. Along with Bell, these professors formed the basis of the critical race theory movement throughout the 1980s. CRT has evolved as a natural derivative of critical uh, legal studies. In this regard, CRT does not attribute racism to white people as individuals or even to entire groups of people. Simply put, CRT states that U.S. social institutions, the criminal justice system, the education system, the labor market, the housing market, and the health care system are laced with racism embedded in laws, rules, regulations, and procedures that lead to different outcomes by race. In August of 2021, a group um, talked about states and their reaction to critical race theory. CRT has become a political football as Significant portions of the United States argue, and scholars argue, that labeling U.S. institutions as racist is a broad-based institution, or pardon me, a broad-based assertion that anyone associated with those institutions is also a racist. This defensive posture has also extended to the assertion that K-12 students lack the intellectual capacity or maturity to address CRT with all of its nuances and complexities. And I can think you can see from my even very brief introduction that it is extremely nuanced and it is extremely complex. As to this latter assertion regarding those complexities and nuances, critical race theory has historically found its home 
and will continue to historically find its home in college and law school classrooms. On the contrary, at MCS, it is our goal to provide a diverse educational experience that emphasizes culturally responsive and diverse approaches to learning. This is fundamentally distinct from and different from any relationship to CRT, both in theory and in practice. Our approach, relying heavily on primary source materials, is constructed in order to provide MCS students with exposure to a broad array of academic materials in English language arts and social studies. While certain events in US history will not and should not avoid the specter of racism, i.e. slavery, the Civil War, Jim Crow, the Civil Rights Movement, for examples, and the histories related to thereto, this does not involve teaching or exploration of CRT at the K-12 level. As noted, this is generally a topic suited for law schools or specific undergraduate college and university programs. By way of example, an example only, I'm going through a following list of things that we can and should study. And Mrs. Snyder, I think um, some of this you are already doing, but these are things that I think uh, will give you an indication, and those watching tonight, an indication of the approach that the board advocates. And I'm walking through this in chronological fashion because I think it will be easier to understand. We can and should study the Declaration of Independence, the genius of the second paragraph that Jefferson drafted in 1776. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When that was drafted and then adopted in July of 1776, the world had never seen anything like it. Uh, when you're thinking about the, the nation states in Europe, which was the primary political basis uh, of which the, the world was aware, uh, this, was, this was radical. Mount Holyoke historian Joseph Ellis says, this phrase contains, quote, the most post potent and consequential words in American history. Over time, this passage has come to represent a moral standard to which the United States should strive. However, we can and should understand that in July of 1776, this phrase applied, as Jefferson drafted it, only to white men of property. We can and should study the United States Constitution in all of its genius, its 1787 drafting and its ratification in 1789. The genius of Article 1, 2, and 3, creating a separation of powers and checks and balances, and the Bill of Rights conferring heretofore unheard of freedom on certain citizens. We should also and can and should study the compromises that permitted this ratification. Specifically, think of Article 1, Section 2, the Three Fifths Clause, and Article 1, Section 9, preserving the international slave trade for those states that wish, wish to preserve it to 1808. We can and should study that certain founders, including Ben Franklin, recognized at the time the moral atrocity of owning human beings, and Robert Carter III, who began freeing his slaves en masse in 1791. And that those founders at that time uh, saw fit to draft and adopt the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, banning slavery in the territory, including the area where we sit tonight. We can and should study Crispus Attucks, the man at the Boston, Mac Boston Massacre in 1770, the first black man killed in the fight for freedom. We should also study the high school in Indianapolis and Oscar Robertson and the struggles he underwent in the mid-1950s playing for the state championship. We can and should study the Seneca Falls Declaration in 1848, where Elizabeth Cady Stan Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and Frederick Douglass all came together for the first time to express full support for women's equality. We can and should study the consequential presidencies of Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams, but we should also study Jackson's abhorrent conduct as it concerned Native Americans and their relocation during the 1830s. We can and should study Nat Turner and the 1831 slave rebellion in Virginia that hardened attitudes throughout the country as it concerned fugitive slaves. We can and should study Frederick Douglass and his genius, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, writing for the Liberator, the, fero the, the, the ferocious John Brown, Henry Clay of Kentucky, 
John Calhoun of South Carolina and Daniel Webster who forged compromises preserving the Union until the Civil War broke out. We can and should think about Chief Justice John Marshall on the United States Supreme Court enshrining the concept of judicial review whereby the Chief Justice and the Supreme Court was able to pass on the Constitution of Congress's statutes. At the same time, we can and should study the acts of Chief Justice Roger Taney with his terrible decision, Dred Scott, in 1857, where the court held that the United States Constitution was not meant to include American citizenship for people of African descent, regardless of whether they were enslaved or free. We can and should study Abraham Lincoln, his evolution and maturation from the Cooper Union speech in 1860 to the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation after the Battle of Antietam in the fall of 1862 being issued in January of 1863, to the Gettysburg Address in November of 1863, where Lincoln engrafted the Equality Clause of the Declaration of Independence onto the Constitution, to his best speech, the Second Inaugural, in March of 1865. In thinking about Lincoln, we can and should study at the close of the war where he gave a speech in April of 1865 where the first time he mused about extending the franchise or the vote to emancipated slaves. We can and should study that John Wilkes Booth was in the crowd that night. When he heard that, he said, that's the last speech he'll ever give, and then he killed Lincoln a couple of days later. We can and should study the Iron Brigade. It's first day at Gettysburg. The Iron Brigade included the 20th Indiana, commanded for a time by a man named Samuel James Williams of Selma, Indiana, right not too far from where Mark Irvin lives, until he was killed at the wilderness in 1864. We can and should study and think about the 54th Massachusetts, including others who were black troops commanded by Robert Gould Shaw and immortalized in the movie Glory. We can and should study Reconstruction, 1866 to 1876, and the remarkable passage of the Civil Rights Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, that resulted in the first black United States Senator, Hiram Revels of Mississippi, being elected. Many of you probably don't know, but Revels attended Beech Grove Quaker Seminary, a school in Union County, Indiana, where I grew up. We can and should study the Compromise of 1876, whereby the presidency was traded to Rutherford B. Hayes in his race against Samuel Tilden, thereby clearing the, ways for 90, clearing the way for 90 additional years of Jim Crow to exist throughout the South. We can and should explore the genius of the American experiment in the post-Civil War industrial explosion from a primarily rural agrarian society to an industrial society. It's very similar to our transition to a heavy tech economy right now, where great fortunes were made with Rockefeller, Carnegie, and J.P. Morgan giving rise to our modern economy, and then Theodore Roosevelt's response in attempting to rein in um, their excesses during his presidency. We can and should be aware and study the Battle of Wounded, Wounded Knee in 1890, and the Supreme Court's decision in Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, where the court, to its shame, ruled separate, equal, separate but equal to be the law of the land, understanding that separate did not mean equal. We can and should study that great president, Theodore Roosevelt, having Booker T. Washington of the Tuskegee Institute to the White House in 1905, and the controversy that generated across the nation. We can and should, as good Hoosiers, study Madam Walker, purported to be the first self-made woman millionaire who came to Indianapolis in 1910. We can and should study Woodrow Wilson of Virginia, seeking to make the world for safe for democracy, but took race relations backwards while resegregating government offices in District of Columbia and screening birth of a nation at the White House in 1915. Turning to World War I, we can and should recognize the courage and bravery of General MacArthur as he led the 42nd Rainbow, Rainbow Division, including the 69th New York, consisting of poor Irish immigrants from the island of Manhattan. We should also study and think about the Harlem Hellfighters who fought with equal courage on the Western Front alongside French troops. Turning to the 1920s, American culture was coming into its own, literature, music being two great examples. We can and should study the, the great literary figures coming out of that period, Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, 
Elaine Locke of the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes, Pearl Buck, Zora Neale Houston, and others like Ralph Ellison and Richard Wright who came later. We can and should study the Great Migration as hundreds of thousands of our black citizens left the, old, the states of the old Confederacy and moved north to cities like Muncie, our own Mary Dollison being a part of the tail end of that Great Migration. As we go to the 1930s and the scourge of the Great Depression, we can and should celebrate the ingenuity of the American spirit with the building of Hoover Dam and Rockefeller Center in the midst of a Great Depression, thereby giving so many citizens much needed jobs. We can and should celebrate that great black contralto, Marian Anderson, who sang at the Lincoln Memorial in 1939 with Eleanor Roosevelt's intervention after she was denied access to Constitution Hall by the Daughters of the American Revolution. We can and should celebrate and study the life of Benjamin V. Cohen, a Jewish man born in Muncie in 1894, attended the University of Chicago and Harvard Law School, and became the principal drafter along with uh, Tommy Cochran of much of the New Deal legislation that passed in that consequential decade. Turning to World War II, we can and should be aware of and study Dory Miller, a mess steward confined to that role by his race on the USS West Virginia, who on December 7, 1941, after his captain had been killed, took up a gun and eventually received the Navy Cross for his heroism on that day. We can and should study the Tuskegee Airmen, Navajo Cold Code Talkers, the Women's Army Air Corps, Rosie the Riveter, all those women who went to work uh, among those at uh, Ford's Willow Run plant, which was turning out B-24s at the average of about one an hour. And for those of you who don't know, B-24 Liberators is a massive four-engine bomber, and the United States was making one an hour. This is just a bit of a digression, but at the end of the war, the German army was still using horses to pull its guns. And there were just General Motors, Ford, they were just overwhelmed. We should celebrate that. We should celebrate the genius of Ernie Pyle from just down the road in, I believe it was Dana, Indiana, as he reported on the common soldier, both in Europe and in the Pacific. We should, can and should study Eisenhower as using his social emotional genius to cobble together a coalition of disparate nations in order to defeat the greatest threat to humankind, the Nazis. We can and should think and talk about the lesson of the internment of Japanese Americans, and again, the shame on the Supreme Court of affirming that decision in a case called Korematsu. We can and should celebrate Jackie Robinson and Larry Doby. Jackie Robinson integrating the National League with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and Larry Doby integrating the American League, I believe, with the Cleveland Indians. We can and should, as we turn to the 1950s, study Thurgood Marshall and his work as a lawyer. His role in Supreme Court has often eclipsed his role as a courageous lawyer working throughout the South, fighting for integration. Marshall's work, among others, paved the way for so many, including our own job, Judge Robert Wilkins of Muncie Northside, who currently serves on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, often said to be the second highest court in the land. We can and should celebrate the heroism of General O.P. Smith and Lieutenant Colonel Don Faith at Chosen Reservoir. Don Faith grew up in Washington, Indiana, and received the Medal of Honor posthumously for his actions in the winter of 1950 in North Korea. We should, can and should study Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks in Montgomery, the Freedom Summer where Andrew Goodman was trained right down the road at Miami of Ohio Western College before he went in along with Michael Schwerner and James Cheney to help register people to vote in that consequential summer of 1964 that resulted in the three of them being murdered and buried in an earthen dam by the Klan. Turning to culture again, we can and should explore the written work in the 1960s of James Baldwin, Harper Lee, and Indiana's own Kurt Vonnegut, the music of Motown, Marvin Gaye, Smokey Robinson, the Supremes, and Indiana's own Jackson 5. The Bakersfield Sound with Buck Owens and Merle Haggard, and the folk music coming out of New York and California with Bob Dylan and Joan Baez. We can and should celebrate American ingenuity at work in space, in the space program with the Gemini and Apollo missions. Gus Grissom in the Gemini missions and perishing on the landing pad to the Challenger disaster in 1986, 
In January of 1986, on the Challenger, among the crew members was a man named Ronald McNair, a black man who was born in South Carolina in 1950, when Jim Crow was still very real, to receive his PhD at the MIT, uh, and then become a crew member on the Challenger, where he perished alongside a social studies teacher named Krista McAuliffe from New Hampshire. We can and should study the Cold War's end in the late 1980s as the United States continued at that time to be a beacon to freedom peop freedom seeking people all over the world with the Iron Curtain managing to fall peacefully, which was no guarantee. And we could and should go on, but time pre prevents it. But if this is an example of a broad perspective approach to social studies and English language arts. Again, this is not critical race theory. This is the ability to see the world from a number of different and unique perspectives. As our students attend school, they want and crave to understand the story of where we came from. And that, that some of those people look like me. They came from circumstances like me and they overcame them. This is a lesson which should not and cannot be lost on our learners. With that being said, John Meacham wrote a book last year, and I'm almost done, um, called The Soul of America. And in that, he has a quote from William L. Shire. William L. Shire was in Germany just prior to the American involvement in the war. Shire was one of Edward R. Murrow's uh, contemporaries working for CBS radio. This quote is from Meacham's book. William L. Shire, who had covered uh, Nazi Germany, wrote on returning home, I had seen these poisons grow into an ugly witch hunting and worse in the totalitarian lands abroad, but I was not prepared to find them taking root in our own splendid democracy. And I will tell you that my observation as a student of history is that we, are, are, we have some of those divisions occurring right now, and, and they are not healthy. I'm now going to turn to Harper Lee. My favorite novel of all time is To Kill a Mockingbird. Harper Lee wrote that in the late 50s, I believe. Uh, she was native of Alabama. And her, um, one of her protagonists in that story is a lawyer named Atticus Finch. And Atticus is a widower, widower raising his two children, Jim and Scout. And he's talking to Scout after her first day of school. And he says, quote, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. This quote from Atticus, Atticus teaches Scout that before you judge or disagree with some, you should put yourself in their shoes, even though you might disagree with it. So, the greatness of America from my perspective, and I'm speaking for myself here, is a mosaic of diversity that, against high odds and threats both foreign and domestic, has come together and thrived to be the longest surviving republic in the history of the world. For it to continue, we must work to walk around in each other's shoes, to paraphrase Atticus, and to see both ourselves and each other from a perspective of grace and learning. As that great industrialist Malcolm Forbes said, Malcolm Forbes said Diversity is the art of thinking independently together. We can and should and will, as long as we sit in these seats, to equip our learners with a thorough, rich, and diverse curriculum that enables them to enter the world with skills, knowledge, and dispositions to thrive as active citizens in a democratic and global society. Thank you. I apologize for the length of that. Uh, we're on to our consent agenda. Um, you have those 